Hello everyone. I wish you a warm welcome to our new webinar series, Sustainable Boost, brought to you by Lumish, a Swiss investment management company. My name is Yelena Tashic Pizzolato. I am the Innovation Director at Lumish, and I will be your host for today. In this monthly interview series, we're going to explore the ways in which innovation can help boost sustainability in the fashion, luxury, food, and under other lifestyle industries. So in the months to come, we'll be hosting conversations with cutting edge innovators and startup founders sharing their know-how, but also as well with big brands who will share the, the how of their sustainability journey. So in order not to miss other interviews of this series, please make sure you follow Lumish SA on LinkedIn. And now shifting quickly to, to the exciting topic of today. So today we're going to address the hot one in fashion, which is effectively how delivering science-based targets works in practice. And um, I'm particularly pleased to welcome three remarkable professionals who've been working for years in this important field. So let's uh, get on with the introductions. So joining us from joining us from LA is uh, Jacqueline Allen. Uh, she's the Corporate Sustainability Director at GAS. Um, and I guess, uh, which is one of today's most recognized apparel brands, um, Jacqueline has been the leader behind the launch and the implementation of the company's first ever sustainability plan and program. Welcome, Jacqueline. It's really a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, Jacqueline's colleague joining us from, from the European side of the, of the gas business um, is uh, Nicola. He is a senior manager uh, of CSR and sustainability of Gas Europe. And I'm very pleased to have him today, uh, not only because of his rich experience of over 10 years in fashion sustainability, but also because of his particular role in the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And he's been an active participant in there that he's going to share uh, some details um, about it with us. Welcome, Nicola. It's a pleasure to have you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. And the last, uh, but not the least, and um, um, effectively the person that uh, that we all have to thank for, for being um, together today is Michela Gioacchini. She is the Senior Sustainability Consultant at Qantas, um, who after a very prominent role in sustainability at Hugo Boss, joined Qantas, where she is now supporting different fashion and apparel brands in defining and implementing their environmental strategies. So it can range from science-based targets to product footprint and similar. So I'm very pleased sharing her expertise with us. Uh, welcome, Michela. Thank you very much for having me here today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so um, moving um, um, moving on to the um, moving on to the to the first opening question uh, of this discussion. So all three of you guys are in a way fashion sustainability insiders. Um, so let's open up by learning more about what you do at the moment. Starting from you, Nicola, can you tell us a little bit more about your current role, please? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, I'm currently working uh, in uh, Gas Europe, so the European headquarter of uh, Gas. And uh, I've been with the company for uh, nearly 10 uh, years, nine something years right now. And I'm involved uh, in uh, the deployment uh, of all the CSR social activities uh, among the supply chain, as well as uh, cooperating with the global headquarters, so with Jacqueline and uh, his air team, in uh, uh, deploying into local activities uh, the global strategy of gas on uh, sustainability, both at uh, at product level and uh, at the corporate uh, and the business level as well. Thank you very much, Nicola, for the introduction. It's very exciting. I think lots of work to do as well. Yeah, it is actually, <laughs> but it's very exciting and never changing. So it's very fun. Yeah, uh, Michela, from your side, uh, it would be great to to hear uh, actually what um, uh, what you are focusing on these days. Yeah, uh, as I said before, I was already working in fashion sustainability. I've done it for 10, more than 10 years now. And I joined Quantis because I really uh, wanted to provide a support to uh, as many different companies as possible. I think that having the big picture in, in fashion sustainability is even more fun and engaging than uh, living it from inside a company. 
So that's what I'm doing now to uh, do what I can and what we can in Contis to, to support uh, the improvement of this fascinating sector. Thank you very much, Michaela, for the introduction. Um, Jacqueline, from, from your side and speaking about seeing the big picture, I think you really do see it with a brand as big as gas. Yeah, absolutely. So hi, everyone. Um, I'm the director of sustainability at Guess, and I'm based at our global headquarters in Los Angeles. And basically what I do is I oversee our global sustainability reporting program, as well as our uh, sustainability plan. And then I work throughout the business to reach our sustainability goals and to embed sustainability throughout the business. Um, which includes everything from increased responsible material sourcing to reducing our carbon footprint uh, to even diversity and inclusion. Really impressive, and uh, we really look forward to, to learning more from you today. Um, so starting as a, a sort of as a backdrop to this conversation, um, um, Nicola, so GAS is one of the um, signatories of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change which effectively is the, the organization and the parent treaty of the Paris Agreement that, um, that many of the environmental policies are being based on. You've been playing a very active role uh, representing guests in, um, in this initiative. So can you please shed a bit uh, of light on what um, this actually means for guests as a company? Yes, of course. Um... Guess joined the UNFCCC uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, the initial aim and goal of the company was to have a better understanding uh, um, of what the uh, fashion industry was moving, where the fashion industry were moving towards to. And uh, since joining, uh, it was uh, clear that uh, the main uh, um, goal of such initiative is the sharing of uh, um, the sharing of initiative, the sharing of knowledge, in a completely pre-competitive way. So we are uh, uh, there is a very large bunch of uh, brands that is participating right now in the UNF Triple C, uh, and uh, we are all sharing our experience. We are sharing our knowledge in order to achieve a better standardization of the uh, sustainability programs and uh, the uh, goals towards the um, the reach of the minus uh, 1.5 degree limit in uh, global warming. And uh, we are acting as a whole industry. Uh, so the, I think that this is the main goal of the UNF C, together with uh, helping uh, and uh, supporting uh, the, uh, it's not the right word, but let's say the beginners or the, the SMEs, so the small companies or uh, the, the companies that are right now um, going into deeper uh, sustainability and climate change and supporting them in taking the correct path from the beginning. This is coming from uh, the great experience of all the participants that they are putting uh, on a share for, uh, for free for everyone in order to um, save money, save time and uh, take the right decision from the very beginning. You know, at the very beginning of uh, this journey, I think that every brand tried his own solution and tried to be the one that can bring some solution. I would say that wrongly, brands were also thinking about uh, trying to find a solution that was uh, shaping and that could be communicated in a better way, for also from a marketing perspective. But when it goes to climate, when it goes to sustainability, it's not marketing. It's something that uh, we, everyone, has to do his own part. So uh, as part of a bigger movement, uh, we can better align, we can have a better um, way to act compact or as one and uh, aiming towards the same goal altogether so we can achieve a better scale of uh, our uh, um, of our initiative so i think that the main purpose and the main uh, takeaway from uh, participating in, in such uh, important in the global um, table is that uh, you uh, can share your experience, you can get the other experience and you can get aligned. So you can uh, uh, have the same goals, you can work together towards the same goals uh, and uh, uh, in this way you can join forces and be more effective, which is ultimately the main goal for everyone. 
So it's a lot about collaboration. It is actually it is a lot about collaboration. It is a lot about uh, uh, sharing experience. It is a lot about uh, trying to find uh, and defining uh, which could be the best practices or some uh, uh, playbook or some uh, guidebooks for uh, beginners so everyone can get on board and uh, be as fast as possible in joining the movement and in uh, uh, setting ambitious goal and how to correctly uh, measure themselves and achieve those goals. Um, actually, as guests, we are involved uh, in uh, two working tables, the uh, one on the raw materials and the other one on uh, uh, carbon reduction. And the second table that I see, the one on carbon reduction, just recently published uh, a playbook which is free for everyone to uh, to to see and use. And basically, it sets the uh, all the experience of the uh, working table. It is set on a, a playbook and it provides guidance for everyone. So it is a, a very important piece uh, for uh, starting having uh, a standardized approach to uh, climate change and carbon uh, reduction. Is it something that can be found on their website? Yes, it, it is freely downloadable from uh, the UNF C website, and uh, it is something that uh, it can be very useful for everyone, even if uh, for a uh, big brands that they already have their own uh, uh, program, it is very useful uh, to uh, measure themselves against what could be seen as probably the first attempt uh, in uh, having a shared uh, and industry attempt in uh, standardizing the approach to uh, reducing the carbon uh, emissions. I think it is a, a very important uh, starting piece for everyone. Absolutely. So connected, um, connecting to your question, uh, to your answer, Nicola. So I would, um, I would like to direct one question to to Michela, and also in a way as a basis of this discussion. So um, when I started a little bit studying this topic, because I also come from the fashion industry, but sustainability kind of reached uh, many of us um, later on in the career. So when I started studying, I, I was really pleased to discover Quantis because. Um, um, especially in the recent years, I think that uh, you have established yourselves as a, as a good scientific partner for brands, uh, which is not something that the fashion industry has been used to in general. Um, so uh, if you could tell us a little bit more about um, the science-based targets approach in general and how you are supporting brands on that. Yeah, uh, as you said, Quantis has really this scientific backbone that really uh, guides and supports our actions. And the science-based target initiative is really guided by uh, and, and aligned with this kind of vision because basically the, the origin of this initiative is uh, back in, in Paris five years ago for the Paris Agreement. There was this um, agreement where all the, not all, uh, less than 200, but still a lot of governments uh, agreed that um, we should limit the climate change, we should uh, keep the, the temperature increase within uh, a certain limit, a, cer a certain target, which should, should not be uh, overcome. And this target is two degrees uh, more than the pre-industrial level. And to meet this target, basically what companies are doing increasingly, like at the moment more than 1,000 companies has, uh, has officially uh, commit to the science-based target initiative, plus so many others probably are working in the same direction but do not officially commit yet. Uh, these very companies really are internalizing these kind of targets. So what they do is to uh, find a strategy, to set a strategy with the help of consultants or uh, internal teams or who they want. They set a strategy, a climate strategy that is aligned with this global target. So the, the science-based target approach is basically a, a methodology that tells you, given that this is your corporate footprint that you measure in a specific uh, baseline year, this is how much you have to decrease your uh, carbon uh, footprint, your greenhouse gas emission in order to be aligned with the target that the governments have decided uh, five years ago. And the methodology really supports you in calculating these targets and in quantifying uh, how much each and every actions that companies are setting and uh, inserting in their strategies can contribute to this roadmap and to this action plan that they 
um, that they develop and step by step they, they proceed implementing. Yeah. But could you a little bit explain for the benefit of our um, audience that is maybe just entering the industry because we have quite a few people that are um, finishing their master's in passion and that are joining the industry. Could you explain a little bit more about scope one, scope two, scope three and how you're helping the companies target that? Yeah, uh, well, the, the scope one, two, three are the, a way to cluster the emissions. So scope one, are the direct emission that a company produces. Scope two are the indirect emissions due to the production of electricity that a company consumes, so still very much linked to the direct emissions. And scope three is everything that is indirect, coming out from the supply chain, from the distribution, from the retail, from the employee commuting, um, basically from all the materials uh, that are input in the market and also their use uh, phase and their uh, end of life, so all the indirect impact. So that's why it's more complex to uh, to quantify. And um, these three all together are all the greenhouse gas emissions that a fashion company um, release in a year. And and Qantas is just uh, specialized in fashion or in other industries as well. Also in other industry, the the big pillars, let's say for us, are fashion. Uh, food, food and beverage, uh, cosmetics. Mm -hmm. Plus, we actually uh, cooperate with many different uh, industrial sectors. Very, very exciting. Um, I now have one, uh, one question for Jacqueline, and uh, it's actually the first that I, I had in mind when um, uh, when we invited guests to to this conversation, because um, speaking about gas and sustainability, it's impossible not to speak about denim and the impact of um, of denim in general, which is a very challenging material when it comes to water consumption, when it comes to pollution in general. Um, and I know that you're doing, you have been doing ma very many good things, um, being a, a denim leader. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about the challenges and um, a very robust solution, I believe, that you have found, so smart gas. So, and how does that connect to your overall sustainability goals? Great. Yeah, so denim, as you mentioned, has a high environmental footprint. Uh, we conducted a water footprint of our 1981 um, Maryland uh, gene and saw that, you know, just for one denim alone, it uses about 1700 liters of water throughout its life uh, from raw materials, from the cotton to the production process and the fabric making. Um, and the laundry um, process, which many of you know, you know, denim goes through a series of laundry washes to uh, to achieve the desired look. Uh, and then customer care, how customers are washing their products when they have it in their homes. Um, so this was a really big eye opener for us. And so how we tackle this is through our smart guest uh, program, which is essentially our our eco collection uh, for denim. And basically, we've created an internal guideline for what smart guess is, and it's essentially more environmentally preferred materials such as organic, recycled, um, or even wood-based fibers that minimize water use and minimize reductions, um, minimize emissions. Um, and then also eco-production processes like laser and ozone, um, uh, ways and new ways of making denim that saves water. Uh, and saves emissions through production. And so we have a goal to have 25% of our denim to be smart by next year, and we're well on that way to achieve that goal. And the way we see, um, you know, and to us, that's just that's just the beginning, even, right? So sustainability is a moving target. That's, you know, that guideline is the guideline this year, but over time, the definition of smart at guess will become more robust and more ambitious over time. Um, it must be holistic. Um, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about Gene's redesign program, but uh, we'll talk a little bit more later about that sort of improving and heightening the standard for what sustainability or what smart gas means to us. So smart gas effectively is not just a capsule collection or a smart portion of, um, of your offer, but it is already a big chunk of, uh, of your assortment. Yeah, exactly. It's not. It, that's exactly right. No, it's uh, it's very impressive because I can imagine also the volumes that you guys are having. So it's really an endeavor. Thank you. Well done. 
Um, Michaela, going, going a little bit back to what you were saying earlier about scope trees, uh, um, discussing um, these topics with the brands from the industry, and this, as you were justly saying earlier, uh, scope tree is the area which uh, is the most difficult to measure, probably the most difficult to control as well, because it is not about uh, the, the brand headquarter properties, brand direct production, but it is um, a circle that is a little bit further away. Um, so what is um, what is your experience with helping brands deliver that complex, complex objective? Um, in which ways do you support brands to measure and to reduce scope tree emissions? So if you could give us also some examples, it would be really useful. Yeah, um, as I said, scope three is, is more complex because it's uh, farther from the core, from the center of a company. And uh, what we do is for the sake of it, it has to be a tool that the company can use over time to improve, to deliver always high quality and a high quality product means also a sustainable product. It's already inside it and perceived as completely coherent with, quali uh, with quality. Um, so we, we really do this kind of work together to, to enable the company to use, to set the KPIs, the key performance indicator, uh, to, to monitor their performance over time uh, and, and to assess uh, all the possible leverage points uh, where they can act to, to decrease these emissions. So you also consult them on, on the action points that they should um, yeah. that they could implement. Yeah. That is important because of course there are many actions that could be placed uh, and could be implemented. Each action has a different impact. Uh, each action has an impact not only on the emission, but has also some collateral effects. So to be able to understand the complexity of it, and there are actions that, for example, on the other side, does not have a big impact, do not have any, a big impact on the carbon footprint, but maybe are absolutely important from other environmental aspects for biodiversity or for uh, the ecotoxicology of, of products or um, and maybe do not really impact in the, the carbon aspect. So it's important also to have the big picture, as I was saying at the beginning, to be able to understand something and the complexity uh, of every decision that brings along a lot of um, collateral effects and, and consequences. So we, we support the companies in, in setting this strategy uh, and understanding what else is changing. Mm -mm. And when it comes to measurement itself, what, what technology is behind it? What, what is like, how, how are those things measured? Are there some standards? How does it work? Yeah, we, we follow the standards, the greenhouse gas protocol, uh, all the, uh, the, the available tools that there are on the market. But I think uh, the big asset is to be able to, to ask the right questions to the right people. Uh, this is really typical in sustainability that the knowledge is somewhere in the company. <laughs> there is always someone that knows what you're looking for and the information that you're looking for. And it's really important to be able to, to arrive to that person, to arrive to that uh, niche of knowledge, uh, the, the technical knowledge especially, and then to interpret it and put it in the big context and to understand the impact of that, uh, of that knowledge, of that information on the overall strategy that a company is trying to put in place. Mm. And, and do you find it so the informa information about sustainability is dispersed because it, it is not just connected to one, um, one department, as I understand. Um, do, you, do you see any differences working with different brands in how, um, uh, like if the, sustain if the person that, um, that is responsible for sustainability reports to the CEO or to, to a higher role, is it easier to reach kind of throughout the organization? or it really depends on um I think it really depends and it depends on uh, the, cul the culture that a company has. There are companies that are very much vertical, uh, some other that are super horizontal, so you can speak to whomever and he is probably able to give you an answer because it doesn't, uh, there, there are no limitations, uh, no silos between different uh, teams. Uh, it's really a matter of, of, of internal culture and also on personal culture. When you speak to people that understand and, and know the, the value of what you're asking and why you are asking them, not just to collect new data like 
everybody is asking us data also in our personal life and it's becoming a nightmare but uh, when we ask this kind of data it, it has a reason and there is a reason behind and when the person understands it uh, and it, it clicks into his or her mind um, then it's everything like the, the doors are open and everything is easier so it's uh, you have to find I think the key to 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 enter in the mindset and in the culture of every company because every every company is like a different mindset and you have to understand it. Absolutely. So connecting to to the mindset and uh, connecting a little bit also to to a few things that Jacqueline mentioned earlier about circular economy, about jeans redesign and so on. Um, uh, so there's been a lot of talk uh, over, over the recent years, Nicola, about um, circularity in fashion um, and the feeling is that somehow um, a lot of pressure even is put on the consumer and um, so uh, if you could share a little bit more um, all the different and I think you're really doing some very cool stuff um, uh, the ways that you are actually supporting gas consumers to embrace circularity sorry Nicola you're on mute I think I'm sorry Okay, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so I was saying that um, since 2017, GUESS is a signatory of the Global Fashion Agenda commitment to a circular fashion system. It means that uh, this is uh, a public uh, commitment that the company is uh, aiming at implementing uh, sustainable design strategies, increasing the collection and the resale of used clothing, and increasing uh, the share of clothing that are made from uh, um, recycled fibers. There are a series of actions that uh, GAS has put in place in order to fulfill this, uh, um, this commitment. And uh, aside from uh, the big uh, collection, which is now getting uh, uh, more and more importance, which is uh, the smart gas, and Jacqueline has already uh, talked uh, a bit about it. Uh, um, there are other programs uh, in place that uh, we are having to help and support um, our customers and the uh, company itself in the fostering a more circular economy. Um, going from uh, the, uh, let's say, the oldest one, which is our Take Back program, uh, which is called uh, Resourced, it was launched uh, uh, two years ago in the US and uh, is going to be launched uh, internationally in other countries in Europe as well, uh, starting from uh, the beginning of uh, next year. We are collecting uh, user garments uh, in, our in our stores and uh, we are uh, 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 we are sponsoring uh, our customers uh, to bring their unwanted uh, clothing back so we can partner up with uh, uh, specialized third parties and uh, we are providing a second life whenever it's possible, a second life uh, to all of those clothes or if they are too damaged, uh, they are uh, then recycled into new fibers that can be reused for industrial use or they can be um, spun again in, uh, and uh, uh, became a new uh, clothes, new garments or new accessories so they can be back in, uh, in the circle. And this is just one of the initiatives that we are uh, having right now. We are using a, a similar approach also for all the uh, leftovers. So uh, whatever is uh, damaged or uh, is uh, considered leftover that is no longer sellable from our uh, warehouse. And uh, this is uh, no shame because it and no secret because uh, everyone in uh, the fashion industry in the past, they were just uh, destroying those leftovers. And uh, since five years, uh, GAS is not destroying any leftovers, but they are all sent uh, to uh, be reconditioned and uh, sold uh, in uh, uh, secondary markets whenever it is possible that a garment is still wearable. If the, the garment is uh, too damaged, then uh, it is properly recycled and uh, it is put back in the circle again. So it became a new raw material that can be used for uh, um, creating new garments, new shirts or uh, new sweater. So something that uh, could be wear again. 
And those are two initiatives that uh, are aimed mainly at the end of life uh, or end of use uh, of uh, the, the garments. We are also embracing uh, uh, new initiatives. Uh, one is the uh, vintage collection, which is uh, taking place uh, uh, now in uh, the US. It means that uh, guests uh, is uh, uh, buying back and selecting uh, uh, old guest uh, uh, garments that uh, are then cured and repaired and that are uh, sold again uh, to provide them a second life and they're sold in uh, selected uh, stores in the US right now um, to provide a second life to all the garments. So we are creating as guests uh, a vintage collection, a curated vintage collection in which uh, selected garments uh, can have uh, a second life and then an extended, uh, an extended uh, lifespan on uh, their uh, their use, so they can be loved again by other customers. And uh, as Jacqueline was uh, uh, already introducing uh, the uh, jeans redesign, the jeans uh, redesign is uh, an initiative that is coming together with. Uh, it is uh, promoted by the L. MacArthur Foundation which is a global leader in advancing the circular economy. And uh, we as guests uh, joined uh, the LMR Carter Foundation uh, last year, and uh, we committed ourselves in promoting uh, uh, the use of innovative business models uh, or uh, products uh, that are uh, that use safe materials, uh, upcycle use of clothes, uh, reduce pollution during the production process. And what we're doing is that we committed to uh, a minimum amount of our collection that must be in line with uh, the requirements, with the guidelines uh, of the L. MacArthur Foundation for uh, Jeans Redesign, which fosters uh, the principles of the circular economy and they establish uh, the minimum requirements for uh, durability which is a huge topic uh, right now in uh, the fashion industry, the health of the materials used uh, in uh, producing such garments, the recyclability and the traceability of the denim clothes uh, with uh, the key focus on the use of uh, safe eco-friendly fibers and production process. Just to provide you some uh, real life examples, uh, the, um, our first jeans redesign uh, collection will be live and available starting from uh, next summer. And uh, it has been a real journey for uh, the company because uh, it, uh, it made our designer, our product developers, our sourcer, everyone to think about in a different way when uh, uh, shaping when designing when uh, uh, when selecting how the uh, garment should look like how the uh, garment should made uh, which fiber uh, should the garment be uh, made from how it should be manufactured in which factory where are the best and more um, also transparent factories that we can uh, use to uh, produce such garments plus uh, introducing some uh, difficulties at the very beginning uh, when thinking about uh, that the um, the garment the jeans uh, should be must be recyclable fully recyclable so you cannot use uh, uh, trims like the buttons uh, or uh, the rivets that cannot be taken away easily from uh, uh, the garment so it forces us to source uh, at uh, to a different supplier for uh, the trims to a different using different uh, technologies and uh, different uh, techniques uh, when stitching uh, the uh, trims to the garment so it really pushes our designer our product developers the whole company thinking differently from the very beginning from the very initial stage thinking uh, uh, about having the final goal to make a denim that can last longer, so an higher quality denim, a less impacting denim in uh, its production, uh, in, uh, in uh, the methodology of production, and uh, a full recyclable denim, so it can be fully recyclable in uh, all of its parts, so every part can be easily detached and recycled in uh, the proper way. Um, so it's, it's uh, effectively even as if you were also changing like the culture of product design itself it is actually it is a very 
very dramatic change in the company and it forces everyone in thinking differently when uh, how to manufacture how to uh, create a garment that uh, must have the same feeling the same look the same uh, i would say is also the the same emotion that you can have when wearing a guest jean and uh, it must be different so there was a lot of uh, uh, it it took a lot and it was uh, a, a strong effort by the whole company really compliments it uh, i think it's also a very exciting moment to live in fashion as well so Yes, actually, it is because uh, um, fashion, you know, fashion was uh, depicted uh, just a few years ago when you were going to seminars and so on. Fashion was depicted as the second most polluting uh, uh, industry in the world. And you say, how? How can it happen? Because it's it's nice fashion, but you have to think uh, uh, in another way and uh, you can make uh, best thing in a better way. Mm. Great. So putting together a little bit uh, the, the little threads of discussion that we opened tonight. Um, so Jacqueline, we've, we've discussed a little bit the scope trade, the uh, supply chain influence, the industry collaborations and the importance of collaborating with competitors as well. Um, so how do you see it from, from your role? So the industry partnerships and associations, what kind of role do they have in this process? And can you give us any examples of uh, such collaborations that you are having at the moment? Yes, absolutely. As Nicola mentioned uh, earlier, collaboration is key. And I think one of the key pieces of industry collaboration is this concept of pre-competitive uh, action. Um, one one group that you know has really raised risen awareness of sustainability and standardized the approach to how companies are communicating sustainability to their suppliers uh, and creating a common language around sustainability is the Sustainable Apparel Coalition. They've been around for about a decade now, and they have really taken over the industry in terms of creating this dialogue and language and awareness with brands and supply chains about what is sustainability and how can we improve. Now, as the industry is starting to evolve, um, not only are these industries playing a big role in raising awareness and educating people, but also bringing people together for collective action for impact. So um, as mentioned you know, earlier, we're members of the UNFCCC. Uh, we're also members of the Science-Based Targets Initiative, which is actually a cross-industry group. Um, I think it's based in the United States. It has over 700 major companies all committed to reducing our carbon emissions according to what science says we must do, pretty much aligned with the Paris Agreement, essentially saying that we will reduce our carbon emissions aligned with the 1.5 degree scenario necessary to essentially save our planet within the next 10 years. So the great thing about the climate crisis, it's a weird thing, to, that's a weird <laughs> sentence, the great thing about the climate crisis, but, it, but what's happening is it's creating a common goal. You know, we have, there's so many, there's endless challenges in sustainability from water and chemicals and everything, but we all have, we all, if we all focus on climate and our climate impacts, um, those will have co-benefits throughout the industry and throughout the environment. Um, and I think we're all aligning, the industries are beginning to align. So for example, we're members of Textile Exchange and even the SAC has all re-upped their missions and their strategic visions to be aligned with climate. And I think that um, bringing us all together in this way is really important and will help us make good on the goals that we are setting uh, for these ambitious goals. Absolutely. Um, so starting from the connecting to, to Jacqueline's point about um, about having the common goal and the, having this kind of shared um, understanding what the goal is actually, uh, which already per se could be seen as an achievement in the for, for an industry that fragmented as fashion. Um, so Michela, um, we focus a lot in our conversations on how innovation actually can catalyze sustainability adoption ac across the industry. And uh, from from your experience, both in Qantas and, uh, um, and your previous career, so 
Are there any low hanging fruits in fashion sustainability? So some practices that are relatively easy to implement have significant impact or is it more complex than that? Well, very, very low hanging fruit, no. <laughs> uh, I think it always requires a commitment as you as you saw from, from guest experience, they, they really are committed in this. Um, I think there are some enablers some some elements that really multiplies the the efforts and the benefits that you can that a company can uh, generate from from a single action and i would say one of these enablers is the is the knowledge as i said before it's really key to uh, to know what you're talking about so to raise the awareness to raise the knowledge uh, that inside a company exists, not only in the sustainability team, of course, all uh, throughout all the company. So to uh, educate people, to give them, uh, to empower them with, with know-how and uh, and information, because it really allows them to um, to implement actions, uh, knowing what they are looking for, knowing what they can expect. From, from single action, what could be the collateral aspects of in, in sustainability. Um, so that is that is key to uh, to know uh, to 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 know your products, to know your supply chain, to uh, never delegate because someone else will know. It, it's important to really uh, be equipped with this kind of uh, of education. So knowledge is the key word. Yeah, I think when we work in, with companies also to provide uh, webinars or education occasions or, um, yeah, I, I think that there is, these are the single action that really creates the most value in a company. Mm -hmm. uh, sooner or later, uh, this kind of, of investments from, from a company will pay off, definitely. Mm. Nicola, what's your view? was a mute, sorry again. Um, I do concur, uh, um, again, I, I do concur with Michela that uh, there are no very low hanging fruits. Uh, the most uh, and the probably the lowest uh, fruit uh, is the commitment, the culture and commitment uh, of the company. And uh, I would say that uh, it's easy to say, and uh, probably the uh, most easy things to understand. The most easy thing to understand is uh, the lowest hanging fruit uh, is uh, to try to move away as fast as possible, uh, as far as possible from fast fashion, and go for a, a fashion that last more. So uh, increase garment quality, increase uh, durability, and uh, look and uh, scout for alternative uh, materials and techniques that can be used uh, when uh, manufacturing your uh, garment. Um, we at GAS uh, didn't thought it was possible to create uh, a denim with, uh, without normal cotton, and uh, we did it. So it was uh, like, um, you know, just switching on the light. And you say, okay, there are a lot of opportunities, a lot of uh, uh, potential uh, changes, a lot of uh, uh, potential uh, new fibers uh, that can be used. So why not explore them? And what is it made of? Uh, th they can be made of uh, um, other um, fibers like cellulosic fibers uh, uh, derived from uh, the uh, scraps from uh, cotton from the cotton industry. So you are using waste, and they are being processed, and they can uh, be turned into new uh, yarn that uh, can be used to produce denim. And this is just one of the new denim that. Are, cu are currently in our collection. So it's something which is not in the future, it's something which is real and it is now. So it, it can be done. Great. Um, so Jacqueline, what's your view speaking about low hanging fruit and what can be done? Yes, I would I would agree. I don't I don't think low hanging fruit exists. Otherwise we would all be 100 percent sustainable right now, right? It's it's a challenge. Um, but I think my my I would echo what's been said before in terms of culture, commitment, um, and knowledge. 
I think and expanding that from internal to externally. So one thing, you know, we've done on our customer wash website or, you know, customer care, how to care for your denim jean, which our customers go to because they want to, you know, know how to best uh, make their denim last. Uh, it's an investment. And so we make sure we've added on some environmentally friendly techniques that they can do as well, um, just to sort of expand that conversation and, and make them think about the environment for a minute when they may not have otherwise been doing that. So that's just one small example. I think there is a movement in the industry away from fast fashion um, now to longevity, durability, quality, which is very exciting and very good for all of our goals and, and needs on the sustainability side of fashion development. Um, you know, one thing that I'm really encouraged by it right now is there's this trend away from seasonality in in fashion um, and also sort of this even guess we're putting out a, you know, a centralized collection globally. And so this idea that uh, we want to make our fashion versatile and long lasting and comfortable right now during COVID and um, this is all very good news. So I think the more we can add value and communicate internally and externally that the fashion we wear has value, the more um, demand um, and interest will create in creating fashion that lasts and fashion that's more sustainable. Hmm. So actually, actually like um, I'm taking a, a very important point that you're that you're adding, which is about consumer education as well, which is which is an important component. Absolutely. So uh, wrapping up our um, our great discussion, and I, I think I've, I've, I myself have learned quite a few things tonight. Um, so our audience um, includes a lot of startup founders, a lot of uh, aspiring entrepreneurs that are um, trying to bring something new into fashion, into fashion tech. Uh, Michaela, can you tell us like from what you see in the industry? Um, where do you see the biggest potential? Where do you see market but gaps that could be filled in by innovative solutions? Um, well, I could think about two um, topics. One is traceability, mm -hmm. because it's really important for companies, as we said uh, this, in this webinar, it's really important to trace, to know the supply chain, to be able to map them. And the other point, uh, I think it really matches with what Nicola was saying before. It's about having uh, the possibility to have different fibers, different materials, different production processes, <clears throat> because the companies are actively looking uh, on the market uh, for, for new materials, for new production that would guarantee a sustainable product uh, and would allow them to be able to enter the market with a sustainable product. And it's really important to, uh, for a company to, to have as big, uh, let's say, portfolio to, to choose from as possible. Uh, companies are trying to diversify their portfolio. So uh, to, to see what else could be done, what could be done uh, in jeans uh, more than using conventional cotton, for example, as Nicola was saying. So it's important to provide companies with this kind of wide choice and I think there is a big, uh, a, gives, uh, a big space there, a big uh, gap there still to, to fill. Of course, it's not easy for small startups to match uh, the, the needs of big uh, corporations because the volumes are completely different. The um, request that a big company has on the service, on the quality, on the minimum orders, uh, on everything, it's definitely not easy to, to match with what a small startup can provide. But still, there are so many collaborations that are starting and so much, so many more can, can start in the future. And this was not the case 10 years ago, for example. This is really happening now in the latest years and it will happen more and more in the future. So I think that would be a very important uh, area, let's say, where research and development can take place. Yeah, I must say that that's exactly what we see working with different startups, that there is a lot of interest uh, um, about new materials, alternative materials. And although there is always the issue about uh, scalability of the solution, of course, uh, as you're rightly saying, I think that the industry is more open than ever yeah. um, to such collaborations. So. 
a lot of uh, a lot of opportunities. Um, Nicola, the same question to to you. So, where do you see innovation opportunities in fashion? I think that uh, the the fashion brands uh, they need uh, new ideas and technology in uh, um, recycling and uh, recirculating uh, uh, garments, both from uh, a tech point of view and uh, a business management by business model point of view. From a tech point of view, because uh, having uh, new technologies for uh, recycling uh, um, can enable the designer to have uh, less constraints uh, when uh, thinking and designing uh, um, a garment that can be re uh, recycled. So the easiest uh, a garment can be recycled the easiest will be for uh, the designer and the product developers to develop uh, to whatever they want and uh, to develop re to develop real fashion uh, garments and from uh, um, um, and from a business model point of view if there is any new idea any new uh, company that can uh, support the fashion brands uh, in uh, doing what the fashion brands are not specialized because uh, they are not specialized in uh, uh, recycling. They are not uh, specialized in uh, that part of the uh, industry. But uh, partnering with uh, the right partner, it's going to be a very uh, successful key. So I think those could be uh, two ideas that can uh, bring uh, a lot of uh, announcement, a lot of uh, um, success to the whole industry. So a lot of focus at the beginning of the supply chain, so a lot of focus on materials and with what you put in in the product, but also a lot of focus in end life. Yes, definitely, because uh, uh, if you want to close the loop, you have to join the two ends of the circle. So from the beginning to the end. So making the end the begin, uh, it's probably the key for uh, make it more circular. Mm. Absolutely, a, a great point, Nicola. Um, and the the final question and the final comment um, uh, from your side, Jacqueline. What's your view? I think I would agree. You know, materials innovation and circularity is key. So we're always looking for more innovative materials. I think you know, there's there's spider silk on the market, um, which is awesome, right? But then there's also a startup right now working on how do we extract and take out synthetic material from our textiles and recycle those materials um, because that's really one of the most significant obstacles to a truly circular economy is the synthetic material right now can't be um, chemically recycled very well so those are huge issues that are still needing to be tackled and only a few startups are right now working on those big problems and then all of the infrastructure to support the circularity um, piece so you you need the technology but you also need take back systems you need traceable uh, recycled partners um, and 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 even sorting technologies and sorting facilities I mean that the whole industry around circularity is just ripe for innovation and things that we probably can't even imagine because it's a new frontier um, and then the only other thing I would say that maybe adding to this is is building on that comment I made earlier about changing the culture of fashion from fast fashion to durable and sustainable and versatile. Any company is looking, how do we add value to our products? Sustainability is one, versatility, durability, style, trend, all of these things add value to our products. And, and for, for us to, cre to, to create that cultural shift to having people value clothes and wear them longer, anything that can add to that story will be important. So right now, let's say there's a there's, you know, a, a, a technology company that's working on creating identities for each product so that you can learn exactly it's, it makes it more traceable. You know exactly where that product came from. Uh, you can learn about the materials in the product that adds value uh, and then it can be, you know, shared on social media. Right. So it's adding value and looking at our clothing differently and creating a different relationship with it. Anything that you can think of in that sphere, I think will be very successful in the years to come because we're all looking to shift our business models, shift our design thinking um, into circular and value. And um, I'm excited to see what the years ahead will bring. 
Absolutely. Um, I believe also it's a it's a it's a great sentence to to close this discussion, Jacqueline. So. Um, Thank you very much for for that. And um, um, so I'd like to thank you all for um, for your time, for your insights. So Jacqueline, Michaela, Nicola, um, I'm sure that your that our audience has found it stimulating. So uh, for all of you watching us, um, please make sure that you um, that you follow Lumish Essays LinkedIn if you want to hear um, similar discussions like this one. And um, Let's discover together how to unleash the potential of innovation and sustainability. I want to wish you all a great day and stay healthy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.